Uh, my name is Rich Schmidt. We're here with Dave and Diolinda Coelho. It's uh, July 27, 2023. We're at Coelho Winery in Amity. Thank you both so much for joining us today. Uh, first question is why wine? Why wine? It's, I guess it's always been a passion of ours, you know, and uh, it, was a, it was a crop. When we moved up to Oregon from California, it was, you know, where did we, we bought 40 acres of land. And it's like, okay, what are we going to do with our land? We're not going to, it's too small to plant grass seed or weed or a commercial crop. But, and then we, I, we got introduced to Amity Vineyards, Myron Redford. And that kind of like, you know what? I think our property is going to be ideal for, for grapes. And so, you know, it took a few years to develop. In, I had kiwis. In kiwis or kiwis. Kiwis, <laughs> yeah. Well, no, it was a pineapple guava. Oh. <laughs> or hazelnuts. But anyway, no, it was wine because we, we had a passion. I worked for Myron up there, you know, just for a few years helping out there. And I thought, this is a, this is a good, I think this is the path we want to go. Mm-hmm. So... Being farmers, um, just just farmed a different crop. Mm-hmm. But it started out well. We were just going to plant grapes, okay? And then we'll just sell the grapes to some of the wineries. And we said, well, no, we did all that when we were farming in California. We were growing crops, selling to uh, Hunt and Wesson for tomatoes. And it was, we, we with our small acreage that we have, it was like, let's make the wine and get it to the consumer ourself, you know, with our name on it. That That's the that's where it's at, you know. Mm-hmm. By growing grapes, you, you're kind of, dictated on whatever the price is, mm-hmm. whatever somebody's willing to pay you, and it can fluctuate. Where we're totally 100% integrated right now in, in the industry after 20 years of doing what we've been doing. So let's back up a little bit and talk about life before Oregon and wine. So, Dio Linda, we'll start with you. Tell us about where you're born and raised and what you were doing before you met this guy. Mm-hmm. Well, this goes way back, way, way back. Um, born and raised in Tracy, California, a little farming community. Um, our home was probably 15 miles or so from the town of Tracy, where you went to school. But you have these little tiny schools. K, well, no, we didn't have kindergarten back then. Mm-hmm. But first through eighth grade, all in the same building. I have 14 kids in my eighth grade graduating class. He went to a little, another little school, neighboring out there in the country, different parts. And you play ball with each, you know, against the little mm-hmm. schools. So him and his little friends used to tease me. I was third base on seventh grade. So that's how we met, third, seventh grade. <laughs> and I wrote in my diary, I hate David Quayle, mm-hmm. which meant you liked him in seventh grade, right? Mm-hmm. Everybody knows that. Well, I don't but know. anyway, so when you flash forward, you hit the high school that has a whole bunch of kids. Um, we're a year apart. So um, I was a freshman in high school. He was a sophomore, and we dated ever since. Got married like, what? That was in 73, got married in 1980. Had the first kid in 85. First child. First child. <laughs> first kid. First child in 1985, and we had four, bam, 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 and then we um, have 14 grandkids now. So if we go way back, it's way back. So anyway, I, uh, baseball was not my professional career. <laughs> but you worked at, uh, you did oh, work I've, at banks. And oh, yeah, I've always been. Um, I've never not worked. We are, I'm from a farming family, so that meant you drove the tractor, you hoed the weeds, you worked the almond haulers, you were farmers. Mm-hmm. Farmer, from a farmer kid and farmer, and there's seven of us in my family. There's, I'm a middle child of seven, we're all like 12 to 18 months apart, and I have a zillion cousins in a very literal sense. <laughs> um, the other ones have five and five. And, anyway, there's hundreds of cousins now when we go down there, mm-hmm. hundreds of them, and it's a blast. And it's well, they're all, not all down there. They've kind of spread out yeah. throughout the country now. Yeah, just my immediate, you know, my seven, there's, you know, what, 20, oh, well, it's probably 50. No, actually, there's like 75 now, just yeah. with my brothers and sisters and stuff. <laughs> but anyway, it's a blast, but uh, they're all different spots, but all the cousins are all very close. It's a, that's, a, I'm Portuguese-Italian, so there you have the Italian side. And the port- mom, dad's from six, mom's from eight. Just imagine it. <laughs> and um, a lot of good food. If you're happy, you eat. You're sad, you eat. Anything between, you eat. <laughs> Food is the comfort zone, and there's always wine. I mean, and, and where I guess if I can add to that a little bit, we're both second generation. Her grandfather and grandmother on her mom's side were from the Azor Islands, so mm-hmm. it's their grandparents. And same with my grandparents on my mom and my dad's side. My mom's side was from Ireland. And my dad's side was from the Azor Islands. So. Our parents were all born in, your mom was born in the U.S. Although our was. parents were all born in the U.S., but our grandparents were all born uh, in either Ireland, Portugal, or Italy, or Belgium. Yeah, because yeah. my dad's the Italian side, Belgium, French, whatever, they're from over there. Mm-hmm. 
And there's a lot of Portuguese community down in the San Joaquin Valley. There's a lot of dairymen, farmers, all, you know, different things. That they, that they seem to move into that area, either east coast, west coast, islands, or whatever. But, High uh, water. Yeah. Not too far from water. Because <laughs> from the Azores. So we were, you know, we, we were growing up with a good work ethic. Mm -hmm. we, they taught us how to work, you know. It's, Unfortunately, Dad never taught us how to speak Portuguese. Your mom spoke fluent Portuguese, too, and my dad spoke fluent Portuguese. But when my grandfather would come over, I'm sorry, I'm taking away from her a little bit. How else can they talk about all these kids? They speak so in Portuguese. My, yeah, my grandfather used to come over every Sunday for breakfast after church, and he'd speak to my dad in Portuguese. My dad always answered back in English, you know, and it was like all the way up to the day he died. I said, Dad, you know, you never spoke Portuguese. He said, no, when, I came, when we were in America, we wanted to assimilate. You know, we didn't want to bring the old language in, in there because they felt like they were, they had the term for the Portuguese back then. They were greenhorns, you know. They came into this country, Portuguese. didn't know a lot of about what was going on, but they were hard workers, and they assimilated into society pretty well here in America, and they're spread out through all over. But uh, I just, you know, and, and I understand Dad's side of it, not, you know, wanting to speak the language. But we have a son now, David, you just met, his wife's a German immigrant, and she speaks German to her kids, and he speaks English. And they're, they got kids. four children, and the youngest one is going to be two in, December. two in December. I mean, they all speak, they understand German and English. It's really neat to see. The little ones will also, will also slip on and start speaking German. <laughs> no, we don't know German. But, Only a few uh, words. Good words. <laughs> like, I love you. You should You know, there's a few good words we know. Don't yeah. teach us the bad ones. <laughs> No, but we went, we went to high school together. Um, we're high school sweethearts, went to the whole school. We had a little falling out once in a while, not too much. Um, then we got married in 1980. Our first child, David, was born in 85. And then we had him like four, four and five years, two boys and two girls. Um, and then, then it got to a point, we were down in Tracy at the time in the Bay Area, the high tech, Sunnyvale, Palo Alto, they were all go, going 60 miles east because the Bay Area was expensive. So they were moving into the valley and they were able to buy property there and houses and it just drove the price of property up and us as being farm kids and stuff, we couldn't compete. And so, you know, we searched out, we said, where are we going to go? You know, we had an opportunity to buy a little house in a in a subdivision, it was a 70 subdivision, and I think the houses at the time when we were ready to buy was, they were 265,000 for a three bedroom, two bath. And so, and I said, we're gonna venture out. So we got up here to Oregon, and this was in 91, we came up, found our little farm out there in Paradale, 40 acres with a barns, house on it, just beautiful property, it was 200,000. Mm -hmm. So when, I, when we went back and we talked and we talked about it, I said, now we can either buy a little three bedroom, two house in the subdivision in town in Tracy for 265, or we can move to Oregon and buy 40 acres with a big farm and everything for 200. What do you think we should do? <laughs> oh, that's a no-brainer. But we, it, was, it was a decision because you had seven, I'm one of five, she He's one of seven. We packed up and, you know, left. When David, he was going to be, he was going to start kindergarten in September. We moved in June. Right. So that was a key thing is that we had to, we wanted to move before any of our children started school. Not into moving. Uh, Pulling kids out of school and everything else. So when we moved, they, when they started, they didn't know California at all, really. Mm -hmm. What kind of farming were you doing in California and what did you expect to be doing when you got here? Um, I didn't know what we were going to expect to do when we got here. I, I knew um, my pre. Well, let me back up a minute. So in the seventies, my, my cousin and I, real close cousins, his mom and all my mom's sisters. His dad was full blood Italian. My dad was full blood Portuguese. So we pretty much had the same thing, except for on the dad's side, and we but we're like this. And in seventy, what year was that? Seventy yeah. five. He got killed. He was 37 years old, and they they were running a dairy farm. And this, my uncle got killed. Hit got hit by a train and killed him. And my my aunt was 36, and they were running a dairy. And so I moved in with my cousin. And we we ran. We were still in high school. Took at the over, time. Yeah, we were still in high school. We took over the dairy and worked and did things. And that became a little bit much for us. Cows are 24/7. Are and they had 80 acres of, of farmland. So we decided that the best thing was we missed a little bit of school. We still graduated. Um, uh, from high school, and then we end up deciding to tell my aunt, "Hey, let's, we we can't do the dairy anymore. Let's just sell that. We want to take the the 80 acres of land. We want to farm that." And we started farming together, and that just we never we farmed the, the 80 acres out on the dairy. We were growing corn, and we and that particular land was wasn't suitable. It was kind of marginal land, so it was limited to what crops we can grow there. 
And from that point on, after that, we sold the dairy. My aunt sold the dairy. It was her, her deal. Uh, we, we leased the land from her. Then we ended up acquiring more land. We leased more land. We were farming about 800 acres of land, buying equipment all along. This was in the late 70s. Um, and my dad was owned a farm machinery business, so we, we got some pretty good deals on some equipment. But obviously, we had to borrow the money to pay him and, you know, and start building our, our I guess, you know, our, our farming background, getting the equipment and everything it needed to, do, to, to farm. But we ended up, uh, by the time we were done, we were farming about 800 acres. We were growing sugar beets for sugar. There was a holly sugar speckles or holly plant. Holly Sugar and Tracy, so you would take them right in there and they process sugar. We were growing dry beans, kidney beans, baby limas, and there was a cooperative warehouse there in Tracy. A lot of dry beans were grown there. We were growing those. We were growing tomatoes for Hunt and Wesson, Camry tomatoes that they made stew or ketchup and stuff. So we, we were pretty diverse in alfalfa and then dry corn. So we had we kind of had a good little rotation going. We were young. I mean, this was I was born in 58, and this was in 78, so we were like 20. 20, and we were borrowing a bunch of money from from a bank. Yeah, I won't mention, I won't mention the bank. But no. <laughs> no, we don't mention the bank. But it was high school days. You know when it started. Yeah. We were in high school. So that was kind of where we started, and then and then we got then we kind of got upside down. Um, that was the eighties. You remember the interest rates in the eighties? Yeah. They, I, well, you might not. As yeah, I say, they made legally. they made a lot of movies about people who lost their farm. We we'll just changed the name to our name. That's all. Well, I mean, interest Long rates, short, you know, interest rates had, had got up on borrowed money for a crop line was almost 20% interest. And then all along, you're buying equipment and you're paying, paying the interest on the equipment that you're trying to buy. So it was just like piled and piled and piled. And that particular year, we had 250 acres of Camry tomatoes and we got rained on and we never harvested a one. So it was Actually, like, they, tr they build us back. Yeah. Pick well, for the boxes. Well, that was for the fresh pick, yeah. not the Camry tomatoes. Yeah. So, How's bad? How's bad? with all that happening, we just had to just throw the towel in. So my cousin and I, he went his direction. He went and he took some of the land and farmed alfalfa. It was pretty simple, pretty basic. Alfalfa was easier than Raleigh's row crops. I went to another farmer and managed a 250-acre tomato farm for him. I did all the work. They forked all the money out and did all that, and we split it. We had a percentage. It was good. I mean, it wasn't a get rich thing, but it, you know, at that really? time, we didn't have any kids yet. Um, and then from there, uh, I ended up getting, I, I got out of that. It just wasn't working right. He, there was a family, they had four, uh, three boys, and I was kind of stuck in the middle there, and I, this isn't going to be very good. So we left, and at that time, we uh, were introduced. I was. You went, did beans or peas when the guy comes Oh, yeah, I, I, did, uh, I did the custom swathing for NorCal Crusetti. It was a, pea, a cold warehouse that did freezer peas. And they hired me. They had the equipment, or I bought the equipment, and we swathed peas for them. And it, was, it worked. I did that a couple years. It was a good little, little gig at the time. But I then always I, worked full time at banks. Yeah. Or managing um, restaurant, grocery store, yeah. water slide thing. I've never not worked. <laughs> anyway, after our farming deals, after I did with the peas, uh, I happened to, I played golf when I was younger. I didn't, didn't belong to a place, but my dad was a member at a country club. So I went up there and just kind of went up to, the, to play golf and to figure out what we're going to do in our life. And she was working and I had, had some time was in between. And I sat up there and I was sitting next to this gentleman from the Bay Area. He moved into Tracy and he had these vacuum trucks. And he, we sat at the bar together visiting and... Uh, he, he asked me what I did, and I said, well, I'm kind of, I don't know what I'm doing right now, but here's my history, what I've done. I've, you know, operated equipment, and he goes, well, I got this vac truck. He was 70-something years old, and he goes, I, I can't find anybody to run this thing. He says, I'd be willing to sell this business to you if, if you wanted. I said, I don't even know what a vactor is. I have no idea what it is. He goes, why don't you come over to Livermore tomorrow if you can make it, and I'll show you the truck, and, and we can go out. And I says, okay. I said, I just told you my story. I don't have any money, and I don't know how I'm going to buy your business. So he goes, come over tomorrow, and we'll take a look. And his name was Paul Chip Chase. He's deceased now, I know by now. But yeah. um, anyway, so I went home to her that night. I says, hey, you won't believe what happened. I ran into this guy in, at the bar at the country club, and he wants me to take over this business. And I go, he, she goes, well, what is it? And I says, a vector. So I says, all right. She goes, he gets $175 an hour to operate this truck. And I says, you know, I can, that's pretty good. That was good money back then for, for us. So anyway, the next day I went over there and I looked at the truck and we talked about it and um, 
I said, wow, I'm pretty impressed. This is a pretty fancy machine. And I says, okay, yeah, I think I can do this for sure. You know, I understood all the makings, how the machine worked. And he goes, well, I'll go with you for the first week or two and train you on the truck. And I says, okay. I says, okay, but it comes down to, you know, I, I, we have no money. We to have buy. no money. <laughs> so he goes, hey, don't worry about that. You, you've, uh, you've shown me that you're, you're mechanically inclined. You're a hard worker, and I think that you can, you can do this, you know. And so I says, okay. He goes, I says, so, all right. And, he, and, he, and then he says, um, well, I told him I, we didn't have any money. I don't know how we can buy this thing. He goes, don't worry about that. He says, well, what I do? I got a contract with Alameda County, which is in Oakland. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I got to clean these three cord, these big tubes underneath the freeway. They're culverts that run underneath. They build up with sand, and this thing has a hydro blast blaster with water. And then the vac truck sucks everything up. It's a pretty impressive machine. You see them all over now. They do it for vacuum excavation. There's a lot of things that they use them for. And so he says, "Yeah." I says, "Okay." He goes, "Well, I got a job there, and it's um, it's eleven thousand dollar contract." And you go out there and you do that job, and I'll train you at the time. You get the eleven thousand dollars because you're doing the work and you can start from there. And I go, oh, God, that sounds good. I think good. you loaned a little bit Well, of money. no, I'm getting there. Oh. I says, that sounds good. I says, but I don't even have any money at starting. I'm going to loan you $5,000 too. Put it in your checking account. But when you get the 11000 I want my five grand back. Fair enough. So that left us with whatever $6,000 to start. And from that point, we just kept getting more work, more work, more work. He set up a five-year pack plan to make payments to him. And we were able to make the payments to him. We got enough work. We were getting, you know, $175 an hour. You work a 10-hour day, you made $1,700. And back in 80, that was pretty good money. Mm -hmm. You know, you had a truck you had to maintain, replace, buy fuel, and, you know, we're, we're paying Tires maintenance cost on like it. two grand each. <laughs> so that fire. took off. Um, and I, I was a little bit overwhelmed because I couldn't do it all myself. My brother at the time was doing some job at, the, at Holly Sugar, at the Spreckle Mill, or the Sugar Mill. So I brought him on board. I said, hey, you want to do this? So we partnered up. And we we did pretty well. Um, he was him and I are kind of like a little bit like oil and water, but we get along great. And so we did that business for about eight years together. And that's that at that time is when we decided that we're going to make the move to Oregon because the kids were starting. And I told my brother, I says, hey, we're going to move to Oregon. Do you want to buy my half of this business out? Because we had done it for eight years. And we 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 still only had the one truck, but we 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 had a pretty good account, so we were doing pretty well. And he goes, what? he asked me what I was going to do. And I says, hey, and I carried a note for him. I, he, bought my, I, he bought my half interest out. He gave me some money up front. We had a savings account, and I was able to take that. And then he was making payments to us for five years. So he asked, he goes, what are you going to do in Oregon? I said, as long as you don't quit paying me, I'll, I'll figure it out. I got five <laughs> years, you know. <laughs> and he gave, he gave me a nice size money up front. And that, I took, we took that money. We went out to the farmer where we bought the property. And he carried the note, but he wanted so much money down. So all the money my brother gave us, with him, I think we kept about 10000 of it. We, the farmer carried the note. We gave him so much money down. We, we made payments to, to him. Remember, and, we lost everything, so the <laughs> bank is not going to loan money. Yeah, we didn't have any credit. And then moving up to Oregon, we didn't. I mean, it was like no you don't credit. have a job. How are you going to borrow money? We didn't know one person when we moved here. Right, but the farmer, the guy we bought the property from, took a liking to us. You know, we had a little family, and um, yeah, he was he was real he had, good. Yeah, he was he, good. but he was getting nine percent interest on the money at that time. Was pretty good return on, you know. But he worked out way it was good for us and him. And so we did that. We came up here, and that's when we bought our property. I went to work for Myron up there. When, at first, I worked for the guy, the farmer that we bought from. I, you know, I knew farming, and mm -hmm. I was running tractor work and farm labor. But I wasn't making a lot of money. Um, and then, and then I went to work for Myron up there, uh, you know, working in the vineyard because I thought I wanted to change. The wine industry really sounds really interesting to me. Being background in agriculture, mm -hmm. never grew grapes in California, so. We went to work for Myron, and that lasted a couple years. And then we were home reading the newspaper one night. You were reading the paper, and you said, hey, there's an opening in the city of McMinnville for somebody to run their vacuum truck. <laughs> oh, well. And I go, God, I was a professional at that. I should be able to get that job, no problem. And I went in for the interview, and she says, Dave, we got to get something better than where you're working now. Because it's just barely paying on milk and eggs. Well, well we, we had four kids, and the city gave us all the insurance, you know, medical. At that time, they gave full deal. I, we had a large everything. garden. No, I grew everything at the house. We, we did. Didn't get paid a lot, but all those benefits helped with the you know raising the kids. Mm -hmm. So, I went in and interviewed at the city of McMinnville for the job, and I was a top candidate for it. There's no question about it. But one of the guys that worked down 
in the wastewater plant wanted that job too and they hired within and then after they I said I didn't get no no we we hired this guy and I, I knew how that mm -hmm. deal works that but if you want his job you can have his job and I go at the wastewater plant <laughs> <laughs> I said, all right, I'll do it. I'll do it. So we did. I went to work there. We had a nice you know, steady income coming in. We were all of our medical was covered, and we had our farm out there. First we were, time ever in our life, yeah, and the only time, actually. So we were out there, and we planted red clover on our property. And our farm, The guy we bought the property <laughs> helped us along. He'd worked the ground. And I mean, it, it was real nice. It was real nice that he, he helped us. He gave us a little start there. Um, and so we did that. I worked for the city about three years, and then my brother gives me a phone call. He goes, "Hey, Dave." He says, "I, you know, he's been making his payments all along." He goes, "I found this vac truck down here, a used vac truck." And he says, "I don't know if you want to do that in Oregon or not." And I says, "Well, I, I'm, I'm interested, but I can't right now. I can't afford the vac truck." He goes, "No, I'll buy it." He says, "I'll buy it. Just take it off what what I owe you." And he says, then immediately, the first thing that popped in my mind, damn it, I sold my business too cheap to him. <laughs> he had money and I didn't. <laughs> but it all worked out well. So he bought the truck. I brought it up here to Oregon. And I was working four tens for the city. And four, four tens off four, four tens off two. So I was had four days off one week, two days off the next week. So I started to fix that truck. I started doing odd jobs on my days off with that back truck. It was an old gas 74 truck. I mean, but I, I worked on it, got it operational. And it, it was good just in a local area. And I found enough work for it that I, then I started making more money on my days off than I was making for the city. I didn't have the benefits, obviously, because I was self-employed. And so then I was, I says, okay. And I'd get calls on my cell phones were out then. And I'd get called at the city. And they didn't want you to do personal calls on the thing, which was fine. But I'd always tell people that, you know, hey, I was busy right now. I can't get to it till this day. Okay, well, we can do it. I, you know, I was working in the city. I could have done it if I wasn't working. <laughs> but I put them off on my days off, and it worked out. But then it got to a point. Um, I told her, I says, uh, I says, God, I'm getting a lot of calls here, and this old truck can't do it. And then McMinnville has a big steel mill in there. Mm -hmm. And I landed the contract with them. And it was like I had a truck in there three or four days a week doing their work. And that was just right down the road. It was an ideal scenario for us. And so I told, okay, I got, we got to make a decision. I either got to buy a brand new truck or, or just not do this and stay where we're at. And I says, I can't work for the city anymore. I mean, it... It, city work. There are a lot of good guys, but he's great guys. To break. Oh, I, I just I couldn't, I couldn't short. do it. I, I just couldn't do it because I've always been self-employed, and it was just like, you know, we didn't take breaks, and, and I understand businesses like we give our people breaks and everything else, but I was never used to that. And I said, God, we get out, we get on a job, and they call me. We got to go back in to take a break. I'm going, what? Time we get back out to the job. Oh, it's lunchtime. And it's like, God, dang, can't get nothing done. <laughs> <laughs> but met great okay. guys, and I, I understand all that. So I, I decided, I says, you know, we're going to buy the new truck. She goes, well, okay. And so I called the, the manufacturer who makes these VAC trucks. They're in Streeter, Illinois, Vactor, Jet Rock, Vactor Manufacturing. And I talked to them, and I says, hey, this is what I got. I want to buy a new truck. And they went and said, oh, we had to send our financial stuff. And it didn't look very real well. We did have the property that we were buying. So, And then they said, yeah, we can do it, but collateral has to be your property. So I went home and told her, I said, hey, we're going to do this, but we've got to put our property up for the collateral to buy this truck. She was, no, we're not going to do it. I said, yes, we're going to do that. We have to. We paid, I'm not going to say what we paid, but the truck was more money than our what property. we bought our property was. <laughs> and so anyway, we went ahead and did it. No, we, my big thing was if you, whatever decision you make, both feet are in, you can't straddle a fence. Mm -hmm. When you make this decision, you're in. Don't keep one foot on both sides. And we did that. Don't I mean, be wishy-washy. We, we knew that. Yeah. And, you know, you helped with the business. You were the backbone of it as well. I mean, you did all the, the billing and you know, everything that I couldn't do. He would take me out and teach me how to drive the truck and go out there. And I said, can I fire myself, please, and thank you? Um, because they're big trucks. And I said, I'm not driving this silly thing. I've gone on a number of jobs with them. And, you know, I, I have a height deficit. You know, I'm not very tall. I said, we've got to get some walkie-talkies because I can't see your hand signals, you know, a mile down the road. So if I Well, we're get... cleaning pipes and you're running the hose and you can run three or... We had 500 feet of hose on our, on our reel. 
So we jet the, the, <laughs> the, the, the nozzle, you screw a nozzle on the end of the hose and you're pumping 100 gallons a minute at 2,000 PSI. It was like one of those wiggle worms that you used to play in as a kid with the hose. It had the pressure and made thrust, but much greater. So oh, you'd cut, dry that up the pipe and then you'd hydraulically reel that in and just blast everything towards the vac truck and you'd totally evacuate the underground system. Great machine and great need up here in Oregon with as much rainfall and everything else. No one even get. heard of it at that time. You were kind of one of the first ones. So anyway, I'll go back to where we, when we ended up buying the truck. We put all that up online and I out ordered the truck the spec I wanted. It was going to be six months before it came in and I gave my I knew the truck was going to, I gave my notice to the city and we took the truck on and, and I worked worked pretty hard. We worked we worked a lot. So yeah. then we were able, we got out the steel mill, we were doing the paper mills at the time. Uh, Oregon City had a paper mill, Newburgh had a paper mill, we we're doing all their industrial cleaning. We were working for contractors that were laying underground sewer and storm brand new subdivisions. And most of the subdivisions before the city would come in and accept the curb from curb curb to gutter in, in the center, they'd inspect the pipes. You know, if there's mud in the mm -hmm. pipes, they're not going to buy it. The contractor's responsible for cleaning. They want to, when they're going to buy something, they want new, new clean. So we did, we got on with contractors and we were able to clean every catch basin before the city purchased it or whatever um, municipality or government agency that was buying it. We cleaned everything. So that worked really well. And then on top of the steel mills and the industrial cleaning, uh, hired a good kid that worked for us. Um, the Cedro was really a good. Side note, one good reason being short, because you're walking a lot of pipes, a lot of drains. <laughs> I didn't have to duck no. as much as the tall guys. <laughs> Those were confined spaces, and we won't get into that right now. <laughs> There's well, a lot of rules for though. confined spaces. Never did now. find the Ninja Turtles, but there is some interesting stuff uh, in those pipes. So anyway, we Fall did that. We, we were doing pretty good with that. We were you know, working hard, had a guy, and then and then I says, you know, I'm, I, I got to get somebody else to do this. I was, you know, I wasn't old, but I was getting up. There was a lot of work, and they need somebody. Well, we, that's when we, we ended up had bought, second bought a second truck, and I couldn't run both trucks. So then I had the word out around here that I was looking for somebody, a local farm kid here. It was, his family's been here century or whatever century old farms. He went. He he. Well, he's about a half a generation behind me. He's not a full generation, I don't think. Anyway, he went in the Marines after far while working on the farm, came out after four years, and he came here looking for work. And the only thing that was really available that was farm jobs. And somebody get, told him, hey, go talk to Dave Coelho. He, he's got these vac trucks. He's looking for somebody. So he came over to our home out there one night where I parked the trucks, where we parked the trucks in the... Uh, he, I interviewed him, and he kept calling me, sir, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, sir. And yes. Mr. Quayle. Mr. Quayle, Mr. Quayle. I, God, this is nice. <laughs> so he left, and I walked in the house. I told her, I'm hiring that kid. <laughs> so well, we, farm boy, they know yeah, they so have we to hired him, too. and he knew equipment, and just a hard-working, strong, and, you know, he, he, so we hired him, and he was, he, we broke him in, and he was running the trucks, got his CDL, and, uh, he did a great, great job for us, and I was slowly but surely backing out of that a little bit. I'd still get it, and then, and then we started. Then we had a little bit of revenue from that that company that we started here. It was called Orvac, um, Oregon Vacuum, um, and then we were we were able to to plant the vineyard. We had enough res reserve, some funds there that we said, okay, now we can do something with our forty acres. Mm -hmm. We're going to plant grapes, mm -hmm. and that was in late right at two thousand. We planted the vineyard in two thousand and two. We bought a brand new truck in 96, and so we did that from 96 until, well, we, he came on in about 2000, and uh, so we did that. We bought a second truck, and then Jeff, his name was Jeff, uh, he worked hard on it, and we then I started f phasing a little bit more, developing the vineyard, doing that, looking, seeing, well, we didn't own this building or anything at the time because we knew once we planned the vineyard, we were gonna have at least three years before we'd get a baby crop. And so we said, we got time. Um, so we ended up getting the truck and he was working hard for us. We were getting more and more work and I was still going out there. We was, went as far as Nevada. We've traveled all over Seattle, Eastern. I mean, we, we, our radius was probably 300 or more miles. Cause that truck at that time, too just many. a local area couldn't, I mean, you, you wouldn't survive with that. We, except for like the steel mill and the paper mills, but. Uh, the steel mill became, once we started working in there, they were having us in there all the time. That's okay, moving forward, 
um, you know, we, we wanted to get out. We was getting to a point where, you know, I want to focus more 100%. The grapes were going to get there. we got to figure out what we're going to do with the grapes. So we ended up selling the business to Jeff. He worked for us. For, that was about 16 years. Now, he must have came on in late in the late 90s because I think we sold to him in uh, <clears throat> 2007. But anyway, we, we ended up selling. We worked the same deal. We carried the note. We didn't expect a bunch of money up front. He was a hard worker. We wanted to give him an opportunity. And, you know, he, he earned it because he took a lot of load off of us. And uh, He's got a good, successful business. Because yeah, I think no, when we sold, got, we were up to three trucks. And yeah, we had three trucks yeah. at the time. And uh, and now he's got, he he actually recycled those trucks. He, he's upgraded. So he's modernized his trucks. I don't I don't think he has any of the, no, he has the, the 2007 Volvo that we bought. But then he's got two other brand newer ones, so he's done really well with that. We worked our way out of that, um, and then focused on on the grapes and, and the farming. Well, I think originally um, when we we're doing the grapes, I think when we first planted them, this was a secret. It wasn't planning on making wine at that given right. time, but we knew we had time to do that. And then in the meantime, between all that, the property where we moved our Orvac business to, which is on the other side of this building. Uh, but there, the gentleman that owned this building, um, it never went up on public for sale. He contacted us, and he didn't want this building anymore. And we didn't necessarily. They lived in Alaska. I yeah, believe, lived yeah. in Alaska, and so we didn't really want this building. That was Orvac time. And then when the grapes, well, you know, I guess we can get the building, and maybe we'll just do a winery. It's kind of organically grew. <laughs> I said, well, okay, why not? So we leased this out for a few years when we had it to another gentleman that had different businesses in here. So then, um, okay, the crop's coming off and uh, first harvest is 2004, baby. So that is when um, this front didn't look like anything to you know, look at. But the back, we finished the back side of this building and to the process area. But we were still in the vector business. So we did, we knows how to do all the underground and we cut the earth and made the pipe drains and your storm drains and your... All the septic tanks, all the, all septic, the, all the, the level phase, tanks. We, we did all did. that ourselves. So, I mean. you know, it was very cost effective. So, okay, we did that. And we have a lot of cu nieces and nephews, and they lived with us. And it's like, okay, got a job for you. And have pictures and you know, all these doors and everything. We just renovated. These used to be outside doors. And so they scraped a lot of paint off and helped tear things out of here. And that used to be a two story. That's the wall here. And boy, the best part they had, though, the original window, same wall, got the, let them throw all the rocks through the windows, <laughs> the bricks. <laughs> Come on, as a kid, you have to admit that's kind of fun. And are the big plate ones. Stand yeah, probably, back. Probably a little more dangerous. Than Maybe a little more today. dangerous, but they're all related. They weren't, they, they weren't tampered or tempered No, windows. they come down in sheets. Oh, but, you know, they had you to stay back. back about it now. God, what if a piece I know. Well, they stood back far <laughs> enough. Come on, that's kind of fun. So we let them do that and then clean it all up and then re-raise the floor here because what have you. But anyway, a lot of our own children and our nieces and nephews, uh, they, they paid yeah, they good, dug in and helped. They got paid yeah, by good food yeah. and a lot of fun. Yeah. But um, no, it was good. So then we ended up processing our first process in the back in 2004, I'd say baby. But the front, this wasn't done until 2005. We did open on Thanksgiving in 2005. Um, the with tasting only, room, yeah, yeah, the tasting room. <clears throat> Maybe only one toilet worked at the time, but it all, it all gelled and here we are today. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's all stopped in baby steps. That's what I say, you know, you get an infant, you don't want to, well, a lot of people do adopt te teenagers, but when you get them as a baby, you don't really, you, you're raising it as, you know, the child or your business. Mm -hmm. Small steps, don't get too excited. Mm -hmm. Or try not to. Try not to worry too much. Because it's going to happen. What, whatever's going to happen, it's going to happen anyway, right? Yeah. How, did, how did you meet Myron? And, and tell me a little bit about the work you were doing with, with him when you were there. Okay. Well, I just went up there. I, there was a, an older gentleman. Oh, he's older now. Mikey Jones. Mm -hmm. He was kind of, I don't know if you know Mikey, but he's he was, honest. and he's probably with somebody to talk to. He knows a lot about the old wine. He he's ran honest. with all those guys, you know. He's the one that said, oh, you ought to grow kiwi or whatever, no, pineapple, pineapple guava. guava. I, whatever. But we, I still see Mikey now, and he's just a good guy. But I ran into Mikey, and he goes, come up and talk to Myron. And he says, they need somebody up there. And so... I was kind of working in the vineyard, and, and then I got in and worked on some of the tractors. I serviced all them. He didn't. He goes, wow, you know a little bit about everything. The bottling line would mess up, and I'd go in there and twink, tinker with that. And he goes, I can't believe it. You know, you're, you're pretty good about everything. And I was digging things with backhoes and whatever they needed, I did for them, you know. So um, 
it was kind of, and Myron comes in, you know, I mean, he hasn't been in for a long time, but when we open this up, he goes, man, now you look at you, what you've done. <laughs> and so I said, well, you know, I learned a lot from working up there with you too. And he was, you know, he was one of the original guys, Myron and David Adelsheim and Dickie Rath and, uh, yeah, the, the handful of them there, David Latt and all them. But, uh, yeah, I just, I went up there and just, and I was hired, he hired me. And so... Yeah, it was, I, I think I was there a couple of years. Couple of years. Staying in and out, doing different odd yeah. things. Mm -hmm. So we can buy milk because we farmed, like I say, out there too. A huge garden and all the animals, you know, we butchered and eat whatever. So, but there was never a milk cow coming on that property. Mm -hmm. Well, we had four We're raised around that too. You know, milk, you got to do that twice a day, and there's no if, and, buts, or what's. It's got to happen. Well, we had a farm. We had the buildings. <laughs> we had everything. And it's just like if you don't use the buildings to their fullest, what good are the buildings? Mm -hmm. So we built corrals for sheep. We had a deal for cows, steer, uh, beef cows. We had a couple of, con we poured a concrete slab. We raised a couple of hogs. You know, we mm, always chickens raised. Chickens and turkeys. But and we always raised three or four or five hogs, and we'd sell three, and we'd keep, that would basically the give us pays for our pays for meal. <laughs> so all of our pork or whatever we had was. You know, it was, you know, just a little didn't cost us anything. Well, eh? Monetary labor, yeah. And the same with the cow. We'd raise two cows, we'd sell one, and pay, you know, so we were pretty creative about that. Um, That's kind of cute because we have the garden too, and the kids, they're all doing it now. Well, I'll never have a garden. Oh, yeah, well, we'll talk about that later. Of course, they all do. Yeah, all but, our kids um, have the berries children. and stuff. So we'd go sell them. I said, if we sold them for, I don't say 10, they got five. The farm always kept half. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so it always worked out. So that's how their money. Whatever you want to buy, well, it's going from your half. Yep. The frivolous. Well, oh, you had to teach the, them. They were, you know, they were the cost everything for sure. Yeah, and they're all successful doing their thing. Yeah. And they're doing the same thing. That's funny. Couldn't have been that bad. <laughs> <laughs> but when we start, go ahead. You have a question? So when we started making the wine our first year in 04, it was like she kept to me, well, you don't know how to make wine. I said, no, I took a class at Chemeckina, and I, I went through the program, and I says, yeah, I know, but I, I don't know if I really want to do it or not. But I said, yeah, we'll do it. And I, we hired a headhunter. Um, I know I remember his name, but I'm not going to mention yeah, his name. Yeah, that's right. Anyway, so he says, hey, Dave, he says, I, we can probably find a winemaker out there because there was a lot of guys that were make, wanted their brand. They were working for other wineries, either number two in the cellar or number three in the cellar, but they wanted to make wine. But the winery that they were working in at that time never allowed them to use their facility. So these guys were pretty, you know, um, passionate about winemaking. So we hired a guy. He found a guy. We brought him in here, and he says, you can probably get him to make your wine. You can learn from him because he has experience. As long as you let him make his wine here and give in return, he makes sure. So we didn't have to pay him. Mm -hmm. You know, he was making about, I think at the time, what was he making? A yeah. thousand cases? And we were making like 400. Mm -hmm. And so, okay, we'll do that for two years. And then the second, the third year, it was like, okay, he's, he was making a little bit more than we were still. And I said, well, this is going to, we're going to have to figure something else out because he was getting a pretty good deal of it. Um, and then, then he ended up going to somebody else. I think we said you had to pay us a little bit. It wasn't much, but um, I didn't feel like we he were getting He was recruited. That, you know, I didn't feel we were getting a 100% benefit out of his knowledge. But anyway, it didn't matter. <laughs> um, so it all worked out. Yeah, it all worked out. So we, we were able to learn under him uh, what he did. He had his own style, like every winemaker has their own style. Um, and then and then at that time, correct me, when did we he, start bringing APs in? Uh, actually, pretty much in the beginning. Yeah. We were debating. So, and that's kind of. You want to explain what an AP is, or you guys know what AP is? Yeah, okay. And folks out there, do you know what an AP is? Huh? What's an AP? Whatever. We'll anyway, alternating proprietor. So it's just where other winemakers come in and they use a the facility and they pay a rent base, whether it's by case or by Ton. tonnage, however you figure out your deal. But they keep all their own paperwork, which is ideal. Custom Crush, we have to keep all the paperwork, mm -hmm. which is, there's a lot of paperwork when you're into alcohol. So I like so APs. I, at one time, we had, I think we had like six, six, six to APs seven, yeah. in here. So yeah. we weren't using the building to our, its capacity because we were, we were slow to, we were making more. But then our, once our vineyard got into production, we were taking more. Um, but we said, why do we have all this? We might as well capitalize on this space. And if other people have a need for it and we can make revenue doing it, let's do it. And, and we bought, so at that time, the, the first guy we brought in left, and we had another guy come in, wanted the same thing. We offered the same thing. I think we paid him, though, because he was, yeah, pretty, he was, he was pretty good. So we, at one time, I think we had six different winemakers in here. So I, we were learning a lot by everybody's style. 
you know, it was this it was your own, you know, college, if you will. You yeah, know. and I called it that too. Like the, these different the, the people that made them have all built very nice wineries after they left here. They we were like the stop bef while they were doing something. Yeah, we were in. their stepping stone to stepping get in stone the, and, Yeah, which was nice. All good people. It was a lot of fun. A lot of different languages. So, but we going did that for quite a few years, and that gave us interns. that actually gave us a lot of revenue to buy all the equipment that you need in the wine industry: barrels and destimmers and stainless steel tanks. You know that stuff can all add up to money. And if in the wine industry, when you're first starting out, we're on our own money. I mean, you know, there's a lot of people get in the wine business that come with money. We kind of started with our own, and it was, you know. It, it was it was good. So that was a, a nice little thing to be able to build our capital up and, and all of our equipment. Yeah, yeah, right into the equipment. Yeah. And everything went to the equipment. Yeah. I mean, for as far as forklifts and tanks and destimmers and presses and you know, that stuff all, you know, you start adding up some money. Because it's all stainless steel. It's all ka -ching. So we always feel, okay, all those people we brought in to make wine here helped, helped us develop our, you know, build our capital in this thing. And, uh, and where it's so at 20 years because oh I was where I was going with it the wake and the wine is but it's again it's about selling your product I mean we all go into a wine store and you see all the hundreds of thousands of bottles that you can buy from how do you get people to buy your wine and we all make the best wine in the world right I mean everybody makes of course, great wine you have, yeah <laughs> but when your brand is out there and you know somebody and the you know the prices have gone from I think our first bottle when we started was $20 you know, now they're almost over. That was double. a lot of years ago, though. Yeah, that was in '04, and now they've, you know, the price and all that's gone up. You know, it's been 19 years, almost 20 years. So, but how do you convince? I mean, how do people understand your brand? Oh, we gotta have a. If you walk party. into a right, if anybody you walk in, you guys are all probably of age. But if you walk into a wine store and you're going to grab a bottle of wine off the shelf and say, "God, it's forty-five dollars, fifty dollars," I never heard of this brand. Would you buy it? Just on that, unless unless somebody you heard from somebody. It's all so that's about, about building your brand. Well, well, it's also about building your brand and getting out there, and that just takes time. That takes time, time and money. Yeah, but um, the, um, the packaging is important because the woman. I don't know about men, but the women. I know it's a pretty bottle and pretty packaging. I got to get it just for that. And then if you like it, then you're going to go get more, right? Yeah. So Coelho, True. I don't know if we will, we'll, since you, you know, talked about the packaging. Yeah, yeah. Our last name Coelho in Portuguese means rabbit. I don't know if you guys knew that or not. So we, we, you know, use that as our logo. If you can see this picture up there, I know you can barely see it, the Coelho, the name up there, the green bottle. Mm -hmm. We have the rabbit in the name. And a lot of people, when you didn't know that it mean rabbit, they're going, what? how is this? So later on, we pulled the rabbit out and have the rabbit itself and then have the Coelho as the brand. And so, um, it was I think that was one of the biggest things. What do you call your winery when yeah, you first started? Yeah, exactly. we had all these names. And I, one day, I didn't have these sketches inside the drawer. And one day, I think I'm gonna frame them, put them. This is our port room, but it also has heritage stuff. Put in, aren't you glad we didn't label? And then have all the, the thought about that, whatever. So, but we, we just went we up with moved, our name. We move with change in our label, and, and I think you have to in, in the industry, you know, freshen it up, and you know, you don't want to take away from your brand if you've developed that brand over time, but you want you got to make some tweaks and changes a little bit. Yeah, over um, time you do. And, you know, we've actually, we really never hired any professionals to help us. We've done all our Not stuff. even the design in here. I remember when we had this, it's like, well, how big are tanks? Oh, about the size of a dime. So we had paper, circle dimes and nickels and stuff like that. Okay, that's about, that, that works. That's exactly how we did That's that. That's how we right. did it. We didn't, you know, and it was at the time it was expensive to hire somebody to come in and design your facility. Talking, I mean, we these had guys no money. Want some money. <laughs> well, it was really, really cute because this is all reclaimed wood and stuff in here. The wood of yesterday's in the walls, the wood of today's there now. So no one will save the wood of the, in the wall today. Mm -hmm. But that's what all trim work and everything is from the wood of yesterday, as I call on the yesterday. Yeah. But anyway, our neighbor um, was remodeling in these two little windows here, and I come walking in, and the carpenter, carpenter goes, What's, what are you doing? I says, I don't know, but this is going to be a cabinet on the wall somehow. These windows are going to be the cabinet on the wall. What do you think? I said, I haven't got it yet, but it's going to be the cabinet on the wall. So we stood here, blank wall. I said, okay. And then they were tearing the floor down. So I think that's the back. We're going to just do it. And it's kind of funny because it was whatever the color floor was. And a long time ago, I had a lot of leftover. We had a lot of leftover green paint because at our home, you know, White House with the green trim, which I don't remember. I said, I got all this leftover green paint. So that is coming in here too. So we brought it in, got rags. He goes, okay. So he's good and puts it, decide to put that on the wall. So what we do is I just get a rag 
and I don't even clean off the dust barely off these floorboards because they're really dirty. I just got the rag out and wiping off the dust. I dip it in that green paint, and there you go. That's the rag of the green paint. And I says, perfect, perfect. Goes, well, our carpenter then, we had in here, he was like, he you're, you're going to say that. Me. I know, but either he said, you're going to say that. Yes, I, we are, because you watch. And I mean, nothing's pre-drawn because I'm just one of those that on the fly. And so, so we have these cabinets, and then it goes, now we're going to do us well. And then we had this. This is old uh, reclaimed wood from Daryl Floor Joyce. So he got into it, and then he's so cute because he's um, a really good carpenter. Everything's even and level. I said, "Oh, hold for it. We're not even. We're not level. Nothing in here. Put a marble well, in a little row." Well, he is. He is you're building. You got to have a level. You yeah. got to have a little things level. Okay, the floor might be level in here, but maybe <laughs> it's not. But it's like can't do that because you have these perfect squares. And I said, "Oh, we got to kibosh." Notice there are no perfect square. Was that the, the carpenter that built the table and everything? Yeah, this yeah. is Dan. And he is excellent. And then, and then he go, oh, okay, and then he got me. You know, so these drawers are, everything's just from the old stuff. So then he goes, I got it. So that's how the windows ended there. Because it's like that. Anyway. Well, it was so cute because behind the bar, this was an old hardware store, so I had to roll all that wood. And so mm -hmm. behind the fireplace and in here you might see paint and we just turned the boards over and just cleaned them and I just slacked them. Obviously we were pretty frugal. So very frugal but I, I like mean, that, That's the bottom line. I like the wood it was so much fun. And plus you didn't want to discard old wood. I'm not going to discard It's just like what are you going to do with it? Burn it? Barn it's like utilize bunch. it. You know? So we get to the back and thing and he had the idea he goes well so let's put the barrels in the, and then there's storage on the back side of those barrels but on the thing I said oh no okay, it's all right we need to get open. So I just went to Lowe's and I got those pre-made cabinets. Mm -hmm. He stopped me. He goes, all right, you have gone this far. We're not doing that. So they're made from the old cabinets. Yeah, and he, then he was an up, old, yeah he knew what you wanted. He, so knew, he says, I'm going to make them. And then the, the doors are from an old ceiling. The back, when you open it, was the old tar. He says, that's pretty cool. You know, when you take the walls out, you discover these windows. So that's why they're there. And they're all pitted. Yeah, all those windows behind the bar are all original windows in here. We said, we got to utilize those. So that's our barrel room in the behind there. You if, can see the barrels in there right now. If you see a clean frame it's because that one had to get replaced the other ones would be pitted you know and then just knock in the new glass same as the hallway yeah uh, you could do that but uh lot of fun so yeah we, we've done quite a bit over the time it is. tell me about your vineyard tell me about putting it in <laughs> okay we told so the children that's why we had them uh -huh. <laughs> That's no, it was kind of funny because everybody was, you know, this was before they had lasers and getting everything straight and satellites and line and getting all your grid lined up. You did it with a cable and a string and you laid it out. And and so I thought, there, my neighbor had an old Christmas tree planter and I says, God, we're not going to go drill holes and put this in the ground. I says, yeah, that's that's, and our, our home vineyard has got a nice slope. It's not steep. You know, and you couldn't, well, 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 the way we planted it, you probably couldn't do that up on, the, on a higher elevation with some incline. Ours has got a nice rolling slope. We're about 300, 300 foot elevation, two, 275 to about 225 in the vineyard. So it's low in the sedimentary soil out here. Um, so I, I, my neighbor and I kept driving by. I said, well, that's an old Christmas tree plant. He goes, yeah. I says, you want to get rid of that? Yeah, go ahead, take it. So I, I rigged up on our tractor. I put some markers on the side where I dropped them down. I measured it and I said, we're just going to, when we bought it, we ordered our plants from a company down in California. What's the name of the damn thing? Duarte. Huh? Duarte. Duarte. Duarte Nursery. There was a rep up here that sold. And so we ordered all our plants. And I said, we're just going to plow these grapes in. I said, we're going to, I got markers on there. I'm going to drive the tractor. I'll drive straight and have the marker. When I go around the row, I'll turn back and my mark's already there. I'll be in the center of the tractor. And I'll draw. And I, a guy sits on the back of the planter and there's a cogwheel every five feet. It clicks, click, click. So I said, every time you hear that click, stick a plant in the ground. <laughs> we planted the whole vineyard in two days and it was almost 30 acres of vines. That drill is silly business. We, and I didn't, I didn't lay anything out with strings or anything. I just, I mean, now, um, you know, some of the rows were supposed to be nine foot on the rows and then five foot down the row. The five foot. Now, if you're going to look at my vineyard, our vineyard, you have five foot here. Most plants are going to be, the other plants can be directly across from it. This one might be this one. This row might be this. But I said, the grapes don't know any different. I mean, that's, <laughs> and when it's full, you cannot. Tell. And then our rows are nine foot. And I might have got a little to one side on the tractor. So I could have eight feet, 10 inches on one and nine feet, three and inches the on the other. And the reason is that's the size of our tractor that fit at the time. We weren't going to yeah, buy another yeah, tractor we that's that skinny. Was, so we went nine foot spacings, five foot down the row. So we planted that all 
solid, I think, couple of days. It was like in March of 2002. We had a nice, some nice weather. We were, and we plowed them all in. Then we had people. Then we, that's when the high school kids came by. We stuck bamboo by each one. They put a sleeve over them, and they did all that stuff. We didn't put the trellis in until another year or two later, and then we hired somebody to pound the post in. But yeah, no, it was in. The home vineyards is in sedimentary soil. It's in the Van Duzer corridor. Nice soil. We didn't even have to irrigate because the ground is so rich. And I, I would go in and cultivate. And I always said when I, we were farming in California, when you cultivate corn or something like that, we, we did a lot of cultivation down there with the tractor running through the rows, opening up the ground. That was always like an irrigation. Because mm -hmm. every time you'd pass and you disturb that ground, the moisture comes up. So I was real adamant. I said, we're just going to cultivate this and we don't have to water. No, we never watered our plants when we planted them in the, in the first. A lot of people, well, like the first initial, no, we never watered them at all. No, it, it, was, uh, it was fun planting the vineyard. And everybody helped out. And, we have uh, photo books back there that show it, mm -hmm. a few of the steps. We were pretty young. Mm -hmm. how, well, how, how is it different? How is viticulture different than the other agriculture you had done before? I guess I was, the first thing was I was really amazed that we didn't have to water anything. All these vineyards up here were dry land. Like, you got to be kidding me. And I'm, the first thing I thought is, man, that's a big cost savings. <laughs> In California, water was one of your biggest expenses in growing corn or beans or tomatoes. I mean, that was a big expense. And no broken ditches or irrigation, because down there it's all siphon pipes, you know, your row crops. And at that time, I think our vineyard was probably one of the first ones that was on the lower elevation in the sedimentary soil. Everybody was planting up, and, and I, you know, I don't know, I, this is just my own opinion of it. I always, you know, the, the farmers around here were making good money in the grass seeds, grass seed, clover seed, whatever seed, seed crops they were growing. And when the grape industry came around, the farmers were going to part and plant grapes. They were making too much money with low input. Mm -hmm. You know, grape was a high input. Mm -hmm. And so I think, and, and you know, the, the hillsides are great for grape. Don't, I mean, I'm not saying that at all, but I still think, Well, that's what you, you can know, grow on the hillside. Yeah, I mean, so. you go down anywhere in the San Joaquin Valley, Paso Robles, anywhere, they're growing grapes on the valley floor. Now, quality-wise, are they the same? Oregon's a different climate. We're 650 miles north of where we lived, and, you know, so... Yeah. Well, people kind of razz said, you can't grow grapes on the valley floor. Oh, well, yeah. no, I knew they can grow them, but were they going to be the quality of what you think they are because they're going to want to grow too much, you know, they're not going to stress. But you have to we're seeing more and more being planted on the, on the floor now. I mean, a yeah. lot of them now. Not, well, and it's really not the floor. We're still 200 feet. You're not going to put it down at ground well. Down on Rick Rail, there's some down on the flat down there. I mean, but those are going to be more high production vineyards too, you know. But you also have to know the the pruning, and I, th I to me personally, I thought it was interesting because you have to have where they're planted north, south, east, or west, you know, whatever, how that way. But where the sun comes up and down, how you de-leaf on one side first and the other, and the burning and all that kind of stuff, because there is this is very no, we, vigorous growing. Well, we, I did. Um, we did a lot of research, and there was a uh, Oregon had a book out about vineyards, you know, developing mm -hmm. vineyards, and I think who who wrote that book? There was a. Was it David Letter? Somebody had a lot of influence on that book. First, well, I think some of the Castiles, too, were first part of that. Was, yeah, yeah all, I all think Castile them. and all of them. So we went through that book. and um, But Oregon was still, you know, it was, um, I guess it was more boutique. They didn't have the production like California. Coming from California, I mean, it's like production. Oh, they get like and Oregon an still never had plus. that. But we're seeing we're seeing that change. We're seeing wineries from California coming up here and you know they're capitalizing on the Oregon Pinots. Mm -hmm. I mean it's not a, a silent little quiet little thing anymore. But really I think ninety percent of the Oregon producers out here are probably five thousand cases or less, you know. And so if you're up in that ten or twelve or twenty or fifty, a hundred thousand cases, we got a, you know, there's some big wineries up here too, but I think we're seeing it move in that direction. And high production vineyards are good for some of them. You know, all these people want to buy buy grapes that are, you know. Um, but I don't know. I, I it was it was a little different, not too much. Um, I'm growing a crop, growing a crop. You just got to nurture the, the the vines and take care of them. You can't neglect them. So more than just putting the seed in the soil and watch it grow. And then you know you As knew you. Said one time. And it was, I think the nice thing was that we don't <laughs> spray. I guess fungicides are considered an insecticide, but we're not going after pests. We're going after disease, fungicides, and powdery mildew rot. We don't have any really pests to worry about. For California, they had the sharp shooters. They had all kinds of aphid. I mean, they had a lot of problems that were affecting there. We're cooler climate, so I don't think those critters can live as much as well. Obviously, our temperature, we're seeing a, a cycle in the, in the weather and the changing, and we're warming up some. 
you know, we, yeah, that's all goes with part of it, but you adapt to, to that situation. But it, I guess it was like, wow, we don't have to irrigate, we don't spray for bugs, but finding out that the mildew pressure was really high. So you had to stay with your sulfur program, you had to be on that, because if you got powdery mildew in there, you know, you get the, the wet, the humidity that Oregon has because the ground's wet, the humidity, the canopy, all that can, is, is a breeding ground for powdery mildew and fungus. Uh, mm -hmm. fungus. Yeah, because so peanut grapes are so tight. They're not like a table grape by any stretch. Mm -hmm. yeah. But no, I, I, we, we adapted pretty well with it. I mean, I think we did. Well, you get farming in the blood, it's never going to go away. That's just the way it is. Well, then when we What's started, we have our, our one vineyard, and we had the tasting room. We only really offered one, one Pinot Noir from our vineyard, and we're finding out. How God, boring is that? Yeah, people wanted to come in. They were Jeez. getting this, and so we said, God, what are we going to do? We got it. So eventually, we, we in 2016, or no, in 2014, no. We, we, we leased a vineyard up on the Yola Hills. Well, before that, we grafted. Pinot Gris. Oh, yeah, we grafted some Pinot Gris and Chardonnay over to our existing vineyard. So now we had a Pinot Gris, a Chardonnay, and a Pinot Noir from the one vineyard. And then so, you could do a rosé. So yeah, we had yeah. variety. So we had, some, we had four skews that we could, you know, somebody could come in and say, oh, you got one Pinot, that's it? And like, no, we have a Pinot Gris, a Chardonnay, and a rosé, and, and a Pinot Noir. Um, and then we thought, so the vineyard came available in the Old Hills, and so I thought the Old the Old Hills fruit's pretty sought after. I mean, it's a nice growing region, like Dundee. All the sub Appalachians are. If you're anywhere knowledgeable about Oregon Pinot Noirs, people seek those particular areas out. Uh, you know, either the Willamette Valley and all of Southern Oregon. They're all great wines, but you know, you're you're a lot of people that are really knowledgeable in Pinot, they, they seek out the terroir. Mm -hmm. And yeah, everybody obviously, wine's subjective, everybody has a different palate. But we were able to acquire a little vineyard up here in the Ola Hills. I said, God, that, we'd love to have that. And so Fred, the guy that we get it from, um, he passed away and his sons called us and wanted us to see if I wanted to farm. I said, yeah, I'd love to. So we took, we took that vineyard, we had it since 14. And it's been a good little vineyard. It's seven and a half acres up there. It's not big. And so we take care, we, we farm all that. Um, and then in 2016, we bought the... Uh, McMinnville well, AVA one. Yeah, it was a, a Del... Well, we named it Delfina Vineyard, but we bought a 22-acre property up there. It had 15 acres of vines on it. And we said, God, this is perfect. This is going to do it. So now now we have a vineyard from Van Duzer, a single vineyard. We have one from Eola Hills. We have from McMinnville. So we have three sub-appellations that we can compare to it. And it's fun. Chris can get into that a little bit more. We make all the wines the same, except people can come in and taste the terroir is what the well, difference is. Well, it's kind of nice. So you get to travel the valley without leaving your chair. Yeah. You know, you're tasting three sub-appellations. Look all the right? gas you save. <laughs> so, it's a so that's been a, a, a really a, a fun deal, too. So we take our equipment and move it from one vineyard. And Delphine is probably six miles. The only hill is two miles. And the home place is three miles from here. So it's not real we like we're spread out real far. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's been that's been a, a great thing for Coella Winery to come bringing in those wines, mm -hmm. and then we started in '06. We started with our Portuguese heritage. We started making port wines in 2006. Or no, no four. Oh, we four. made the first one in four, but <laughs> it was right. in a 750. Right, it was in the big bottles. Too um, much for some people. So we thought we're going to make port. We, we you know, as being Portuguese, that we drink a lot of port. That was kind of a dessert wine we'd have after dinner and. Um, you know, we have always had port and it kind of goes with our heritage. Mm -hmm. And so we made that out of some Marichaux Fauche. We did it out of, we didn't do it out of Pinot, mostly Marichaux Fauche. And then we had a contact down in California, Ron Silva, Silver Spoon Vineyards. He was growing all the Iberian varietals down there. You know, the Toriga Nacional, Cezal, Tintoris. Well, I think he has six different or seven different varietals of Portuguese varietal grapes. There's their climate down there is suitable for it. Mm -hmm. It's similar to what they do up in Portu Portugal, in the northern part of Portugal. And so we said, okay, we're going to go down and get those grapes and bring the grapes up here and make the wine here. We want to make traditional the way the Portuguese do it because that's, you know, we're a Portuguese family. And so in 2006, I think, or seven might have been the first year we went down there. We, and I was driving, I went in a Penske truck, refrigerated van. I'd drive my CDL, kept that in forest. And we'd go down, pick the grapes, bring them up here, and then we started making port wine. <laughs> I didn't go. He went with the buddy. And he oh, had yeah. a good I, dinner house. Ten hour drive down, a ten hour back. Man, it was a road trip. So have fun bonding with your friend. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, so nice we, 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 we've been buying, I say, since 07, we've been buying grapes down there, and we, we're going to get those grapes. And so the first year I went down there, <coughs> I took a picking bins, and I had, we got what we wanted, and I had two extra picking bins out that were empty. And the Portuguese guy that he is, you know, he's kind of like me, hey, you can't go back with empty bins. You got to buy, buy more fruit. <laughs> so I says, all right, what do you got? And he says, well, yeah, I think you'll like this petite Syrah. It's really good. And I says, you know, all right. Fill the bins up with petite sirah. We'll make two, a ton of petite sirah. And that a ton will give you just about 60-something you know, cases of pallet of wine. All right, so, you know, and then mostly it was for tasting room. Because when you come in, now, now people come into the taste room and they've been pinoted out all over the valley, tasting Pinot Noir. And then other people are making other varietals, too. But at that time, it was like... We, I, we heard a lot of people come in and go, you got anything other than Pinot? <laughs> we make a great Pinot. You got to try our Pinot. But yes, we do. <laughs> so we, were, we brought back the Petite Syrah and the Portuguese varietals that we were making our port wines out of. And then we got the one year we just said, you know what? We have more grapes than what we wanted to make port. Let's just make a, a red blend, a Portuguese red blend, a table wine. We'll just blend co ferment them all together. Well, that's and make been a big them, hit. And it's called, we call it Tredesau. Our Portuguese, our heritage line, we have Portuguese names on it. Tredesau means tradition. Um, anticipação. Anticipation. An anticipation. And appreciação is appreciation. So we, we named all those Anticipate. wines. Um, so the people come in and they kind of have another thing. But the red table wine was turned out pretty nice. And so we've been continuing that. And Continue then, Petit Syrah. Okay. Now he talked us into Barbera. So we, we did a Barbera. Every time I go down, he, you know, I, we always bring back a little bit of time. Well, you know, something it's, else. It's like not another ski thing. And Chris, very much. Chris loves making. I mean, if you throw something at Chris, he's, he's up for oh, the yeah. challenge. Oh, hell yeah, we're going to make it. So this year he told me, hey, why don't you get some Cabernet this I said, I don't want no, we got enough skews. I don't want no Cabernet. Anyway, he got talked into it. So we're going to get a ton of Cabernet this year. <laughs> <laughs> But we make a white port also out of the couple, and so we make a white table also, you know, down there. We tried to be in a But our first year in Old Form when we made our port wines, we've now we moved to get the varietals from Portugal, and we're making all the varietals, and now we do a, a special, uh, we do a wine, a port club, and we we have, bar we, we'll show you our port room in here. We moved all the barrels back there and put it in here. The port All barrels. of our port wines are in here. We have barrel in here since 08, a, a port in there, so, and, and it goes on every year. But I know, the four, five, six, and seven got consumed. Yeah. Amazing. So, but we go from 08 the all the way up to current in this room, so. Our port club, now that we do, people can buy. It's those three bottles up on the tasting room. It's one little pack of one, one time bar. a year. Um, and we cut, we have 100 members. We cut it off 100 members because we don't know that much. You know, we, we don't want, and we don't even taste it in here. We have another non-vintage ports that we taste, and they're really nice, too. Non-vintage is always available. But we have, we send 15-year-old port in the package, 12-year, 7-year, whatever we're making that particular year. And so people that appreciate ports, it's kind of pretty cool for them. And so, yeah, we, we've kind of migrated to that. And I think we've built up a pretty good reputation. We have reputation. a big diversity of wines. We've, we've built a good reputation on our port program. Too. And so it's really one of the hard questions, which is your favorite? Okay. Mm. Well, given the day and the time, which kid is your favorite? Mm. I mean, you know. <laughs> we always pose think that. Do you have children? It. Yeah. Well, who's your favorite kid? <laughs> I mean, on a different day and time, I mean, they all are your favorite. Mm -hmm. And uh, same thing. I go, well, I have a story for every one of them. You know, I'm going to have Pinot Gris. I call it the greeter wine, or they call it the porch wine, or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And that's coming in. Hey, how you doing, Green Rosé? You know, nice to see you. Have a little spot. You're on the deck talking. And then, you know, it could move into your other, you know, your uh, Pinot can be with almost anything. And then you get to the heavier. Now you're eating your prime rib and your whatever. And then the ports, of course, to solve the problems of the world. And you're with the chocolate or your scar or whatever you're doing. Like so, I mean, there's something for everything. And um, <coughs> it's kind of neat. And some people are so darling because, well, because you always have, you have the dump well, bucket. Yeah. And they say, well, I can't dump it. I said, well, you won't hurt our feelings because everybody's got different uh, taste buds. And I always say, thank God everybody doesn't like just white Wonder Bread, which I love with peanut butter and jelly. It brings me to my childhood. <laughs> peanut butter and jelly, extra crunchy, perfect on white Wonder. But, you know, when you put that white bread in there, and then you're going, now I'm thinking grandma, you know, it goes into the toaster. A little bit light toast, it tastes different versus the more you toast it, it's different. And I just say, good thing. You know? And that's how barrels are. Barrels are all toasted inside. But so you can relate to people. They can um, see why, what makes your Pinot, like we'll do... 
everything's made exactly of the three vineyards, mm -hmm. uh, the things that end with the difference. Or, or you have the same wine and you have a different barrel, the toasting makes it different. And you just relate it to people get the aha moment when they mm -hmm. think about that bread <clears throat> in the toaster. Mm -hmm. And that's your barrels. But then same as um, the other aha moment, you know, it's like, yes, another reason, good thing, because you get breads are a what? Extra seeds and wheats and this and that and the other thing. Well, you might like the really dark rye and I like the light rye. I mean, there is a difference. Yeah. So that's what's nice about here. There's so many pinots to pick because they're, we all make the same spaghetti sauce as tomatoes, garlic, onion, but we're going to take different because it's how much of, you know, not that you have yeah, flavors your, in wine, you recipe. don't. But the recipe and is, the you different know, your, site that the grapes are growing from. It's the site. It's the yeah. soil that mm -hmm. comes from what's growing around you and all that. How long you left it in the barrel? What type of barrel you used? But we've all always that. been brought up as wine is is part of our food. Yeah. I mean, we don't look at wine as you know just going out and having a good time, and, which we do that too. <laughs> but we were always brought up as you know we have wine every night with our dinner, pretty much. I mean, it's just like part of our food deal. Mm -hmm. That's what we were always brought up. People say, yeah, you know, we, we drink wine. And so I'm on a Chardonnay kick for whatever reason, but. I never liked Chardonnay before, and Chris has done an outstanding job. But if I want to sit down and go out and have a, a relaxing, not, I might have a glass of Chardonnay, but I might have a, a cocktail, too. So, But when dinner comes, the wine's on the table. <laughs> yeah, wine's on the table. Yeah. So you mentioned that you obviously you kind of had the you sort of had a lot of mentors in winemaking. You had people in here who were making wine for you and people who were making their own wine, and you had a lot of different styles and a lot of different philosophies. So tell me about honing in on what you wanted Quello wines to taste like and what kind of style you wanted them to kind of portray. Well, I think each one we should have their, their own house style of wine, and you have to build that. And either that's through a barrel program, what type of barrels you use, or how you make your wine, the yeast process you use. Um, you know, we're, we're advocates. I mean, we, we, we started a little what they call native fermentation, which once you have a winery back there, I don't believe it's really native ferment because you got yeast in the in the cellar all the time. So, but we've been true advocates of inoculating our wines with a particular yeast, and I think that's how we build our, our program. And then our barrel program, we have we use different barrels, we use different barrel programs. We we have select barrels for each one of our vineyards, and I think that's that, that's where we hone in. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we you know we use different barrels than a lot of other wineries do because it's just we want to build our style. Mm -hmm. Um, and Chris has really brought in a lot to that. He says this is this is where we want to be with it. And he, and since since he's been here, the wines are you know, we're getting some good scores on our wines. You know, we feel we have to go out and get scores. But is that really a true meaning? But today's people go to the stores and they click on the label and they want to read the store. You know, which is good. So he said, well, we don't need to get scores. I said, Chris, we need scores. I mean, <laughs> it, that's that's just the routine. So I, we just I know have to remember some to guy send the just. Line in. Mm -hmm. We're not real good about sending it in. We do. Oh, yeah. We've got great scores. We're plus. We're 92, 93. No, I know. But it's wise. like, oh, man, we didn't send that one. Either through Spectator or James Suckling or whatever. But I think it's that's part of the deal. That's part of the, the whole thing. You know, you got to people want to see what they're buying. Mm -hmm. And like I said earlier, if they don't know your brand, they're going to go off those scores. Mm -hmm. And so you need those. And the cute label. Well, cute label. To get it off that table. I, it, <laughs> I, mean, I guess. <laughs> through, through the process, through the barrel program, how we select our, our, our yeast, how long we ferment it for extraction-wise. Uh, the longer they're in the ferments, the more extraction you're going to get. Uh, so, yeah, we, I think we've got a, a great style right now. And we, we've seen other people, I mean, they'll get it, the ferment's done, they'll press them off right away. Another young Chris is in there, he says, hey, we're going to press that? Nah, we're going to leave another couple of weeks. They go, what, you kidding me? No, we're going to get everything out of it. I said, okay. <laughs> so it's proven pretty well, you know. Well, it's you nice. just got to be sure you're protected. And once you're done fermenting, you're not releasing CO2, but you still get a little CO2 coming in there because that's what protects your ferment from getting oxidation. So a lot of people get nervous about that when fermentation's done. Oh, we're not releasing any more CO2. We're going to get oxidated. Get in the present, present right away. So there's ways to, you know, to get more extraction from it and protecting that cap as well. So I think we, we've done a good job with that. It's nice to hear comments because we get a lot of uh, very positive comments yeah. that um, yeah. they probably oh, like them all. I well, I guess you just got to yeah, buy a bottle people, of each. Yeah, we get more people Actually, so you got to buy three bottles because <laughs> one of them you take on home, you're so excited about, you're going to drink it with your significant other who is here. And the second one, um, I mean, then you know you still have two, and then you have these good friends or whoever comes over, knowing you still have that one hiding in the box. So three is <laughs> the perfect number. Anyway, doesn't always work though, but anyway, 
But tell, it's true. Tell me about the the hospitality program here and how you sort of built it up. What is what what do you what do you offer and what do you kind of want to portray as uh, as as people are welcoming into the, into the place? Um, we're very family oriented, and so it's very welcoming. And that's the first thing. Comic goes, gosh, it's so nice. It's like you're in your living room. Yeah, and it is. It's not. We're not stuffy and pretentious. That's for sure. <laughs> We're not it, saying that about anyone. I'm not else, saying about right? anyone else, but I'm just saying we're very. That's just not uh, us. But you're right. There's a lot of people that are very well, um, welcoming and all that, and that's what we are. And we do different events, and um, like the dueling pianos was really fun because we have two pianos, and they were a, quite a kick. They're coming back in March, but um, and we do the Portuguese Fado usually at Christmas time. This year is the first time we aren't for a while. They had something with their band. But um, anyway, so we do different family-oriented uh, events. And we had a country western band here um, a couple Saturdays ago, and that was quite fun. But it's just a real welcoming and comfortable. And um, they relax and uh, just drink your wine. Well, you can see the hodgepodge of the way. We have different tables, different seating, different, you know. <laughs> Back to no squares and X's. Mm. But, you know, I'm, I'm always surprised because I would think, well, people are going to sit this with the barrel head glass tabletop. It's kind of nice. They all go to, like, these kitchen tables. <laughs> More people sit down at those tables and, and drink their wine. Well, you know that is an old poker table from an Elks Lodge. Very, very, very old. I took off all the filth. I mean, look at the chair. I mean, so they, they get they to go talking, to and then I said, yes, just mm -hmm. imagine all the conversations that were around that table. So it gets them all talking about the conversations, and so I take it in middle, and people bring cards, and they'll play, and have you. I mean, they're, they're old, and um, yeah, I don't like things in straight lines, as you can tell. But so when we have the events, it's going to be kind of the same way. It's just, it, it doesn't force people. It makes it more comfortable. So this table, we'll start talking to that table. To me, the greatest satisfaction, one of them is, if I have people at the bar here, there, whatever, you know, they're going to know each other. Mm -hmm. They're going to start to visit. They're going to, they become friends. You know, even if it's here. I think that's what we and, kind and, of nurture here. And is. some of them stay friends from, just by connecting in here. But if it's too, I don't know. Well, I guess, I guess proper, one thing. Whatever, you just don't mingle. When and people are out mingle. wine tasting, you very seldom get grumpy people coming in, <laughs> you know. It's not a grumpy environment, so people are always pretty happy. So that's one nice thing about it. when people are coming in here, they're they're in a good mood already. So, and we like to nurture that. You know, we like to bring everybody in as a community and talk and share stories. Where are you from? Where are you from? And it, pretty soon, you, it's amazing that you find out that people will know. Oh, you're from there. I know somebody. That, well, I know them. It's like wow. This Long is story a small short, world. you gotta be good all the time <laughs> because somebody's gonna know somebody who knows somebody that knows you. <laughs> Seriously, it's gonna. It, it's um, very true. And like one couple came in and she goes, I think what she called the divine um, intervene. Or something. still okay. She, uh, the way the conversation went, it's 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 interesting how um, people open up. Mm -hmm. I went through this ba uh, cancer battle thing, and so for a while I was you know bald and stuff. But the way the people opened up, it was like. Wow, I, well, I knew I had it for a reason more than just, I, I really felt I had it for a reason. But how people open up and you end up counseling them, like, it's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is, it's going to be okay. Yeah, it's a nice conversation yeah, to have with great. people. We share a lot of the same interests. And, you know, people, yeah. people love that. They really do. They mm -hmm. love to be able to be, you know, we don't, we want to talk about our wines, but we don't want to push it on them because it's just like you guys are here. You tell us about us. If you ask questions about the wine, we will answer it. But we're not going to try to steer you to the wines. I mean, we, you know, it's, it, it's kind of a balance there. People do want to know about them, and it's our, jo our job to explain about it. But, you know, we want to hear them. They're the, they're the customer. Yeah, because when I'm in here, I say, okay, I can tell you in the nutshell, but <clears> I go, if you're going to get a little too techy, i got to go get someone else because... Yeah. There's a well. How long each and every's been in the barrel, or how long did this or that or thing? And I says, there are a lot of skews here, and they're different years. So Alzheimer's can never step in because you're pouring. <laughs> well, you know what year is it right now? 2023, right? So you know that 2022 are still in barrels. Maybe some whites are out, but you know there's 21s and 20. You know because you're aging longer, and how long this has been, or if it's been in this oak or that oak, it's like. Yeah, well, you can That's only. That's just too you much can, information. I mean, you've got a <laughs> lot of numbers and everything else. You we don't expect you to know. All yeah, that. I know, but it's, I don't. We all That's, have our role. I it's know. hard to know go, everything. Too techie, too techie. Let me go find Dave or Chris because <laughs> I could tell you a story, but I can't tell you it's going to always be right. I mean, on the, a factual, factual. Uh, yeah. I'll get close to it. I'll send it in a nutshell. It's all in the barrel. I know that. No, <laughs> no I'm better than that, but it's still, it's a. Uh, uh, 
Yeah, there's a lot of years not go, gosh darn, what year is it now? Appearance, first appearance means a lot. And, um, and personalities, you can just be open and, and not fake, you know, just a real true, because mm -hmm. we really do love people. Mm -hmm. And um, they're, everybody has just great, wonderful, fun stories. Even when he says most people, there are some people that might be grumpy coming in. Maybe they're tired, or who knows. And the winter, it's so sweet because someone might fall asleep in the couch and get embarrassed. I go, well, it's okay. That means you're right. It's all right. It's it's all cool. And if they're kind of, you know, some they might have had a discussion before they came in, and you're wondering they maybe should have discussed a little more before they came, whatever. <laughs> but you can normally always get them around because humor and laughter is going to fix. Well, it. I think well, I think that's what's unique about the wine industry. So too. Everybody fun. has a different thing of you know. You can go to the fanciest, the beautiful list, and you know a lot of things. There's there's a lot of dynamics in this wine industry from. So there's something for everyone. You know, for everyone, exactly. There's something yeah. for everyone. So, so when they ask where to go, you just like, like what type of things are you looking for, and then you can send them to the something for everyone. Yeah. Because there really are. We've uh, we are very fortunate. We finally got out. We ride motorcycles, mm -hmm. and so we got out last weekend and um, rode up into the hills. And we hadn't been out there in a long time. And so and my dad's so cute. How do you communicate? He goes, well, we don't want to communicate. We're on a bike. He's on his. I'm on well, mine. Let me tell already. She'd be talking okay. my ear off. Because <laughs> it's just beautiful. The sights, the sounds, the smells. It's gorgeous. So we're running through the hill country. And it's just, you know, when you live here, you forget. So go on a different element and yeah. ride in something else or do something. And it's just, we're very, we're very lucky, very fortunate. And we could plant a garden. You know, you think about people living in the deserts. So I always think when we travel, it's like, where do they plant their garden? I mean, to me, it's like, where's, how do they plant their garden? They where might not. It? They go to the grocery store. They go to the grocery store. They don't know that milk comes from a cow or the yeah. things in the dirt. I don't know. But it's okay. But, uh, but anyway. So I know that some of your children are also in the wine industry. So tell me about that, about the kind of the, the, the next generation in the wine industry. I tried to get the girls when they're smaller. Did you know those darling pictures where they're stomping the grapes? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They flat refused. <laughs> so now they're older and have children. I says, could we borrow the grandchildren? She goes, no, now I understand. I go, yeah, how cute that would have been. Now they're too old, so now i got to get the grandkids doing it. Uh, you know, <laughs> our oldest son, you met, David, he's working in the industry with us. Our second son does his, has got his thing going. Our daughters, I mean, we've always been the parents that, you know, we don't want to steer our children. I mean, we raise well, them. Well, you through. guide them. Well, we guide them, but, I mean, if they want it, then they're going to have, you know, they got to step up and they're going to, you know, there's no expectation that they need to follow in our footsteps because they're their own human beings, they're their own persons, and it might not be cut out for them. So, but if, if in the girls, our daughter, we just talked to her, she's in Oklahoma right now with her five children and her husband. and. Um, so they're they on, live they're in Eastern little, Yeah, they live out in Eastern Oregon. They're ranchers. Trip. They run cows, and they love their little life, what they do. And, you know, she's, a, a, they're doing wonderful. Our youngest daughter, she's, she's running the Common Cup. She's an interior designer. She has a little gig going there. And we've never told them that they can't be part of it. But, you know, it's here if somebody wants to follow, to follow through with it. So, you know. As far as is it going to continue, uh, that's yet to be seen. Which is, I mean, I would hope so, but we, again. The one son has his own label. He makes quite a bit of wine, and then the other one works here. Yes. Yeah. That yeah. sells and marketing. Samuel Robert. Samuel yeah. Robert. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he makes quite a bit, and it's it's all made here under his. And he's got five children, and you know he's he's got a little farm, a big farm out there, and he's got ostriches and sheep, and I mean he's got. Have a, you ever seen an ostrich run in real life? <laughs> it is crazy. <laughs> he's got llamas, sheep, ostriches, cows, and all that. chickens and, and, and the, rabbits. The, and, but they got four boys and a girl, and, they, and it's just a great, great. So they're, they, they, they have, their lives are on, on their path, and you know it's not for us to interrupt that and say we need somebody to take this over. No, we, we just won't do that. I mean, it's, it's got to happen organically, however yep, it wants it's to happen. happen naturally. And, and David's just, you know, got four kids, and they all want they all they all get to come help at different times for different things, just because mm -hmm. they think it's cool, and it is cool. Oh yeah, my when, hope is when I the would hope are coming our in. brand continues on. I, I really do, but again, it's just we, we just don't know what's going to happen down the road. Mm -hmm. I just see a lot of Oregon wineries. You see, there's been some sales going on. I mean, well, that's always going to happen, I think. And I, we got in. I, I think we got in 20 years ago, pretty on the you know on the time when it's been groundbreaking. I guess. I mean, it started in the 70s, but it was so small then. Now the last 10 years is just like, God, I see a winery's coming, where are these guys out of? I mean, it's like, wow. Where are they? 
But we kind of stay, we're, we're one of the few in Amity. I mean, in Amity has, I mean, it's kind of, the town's moving along pretty well. Uh, and we, she's been pretty instrumental with working in the, the town and trying to get some services in here, a little restaurant. And, but again, it's just, it's, it's hard, you know, it's got to happen on its own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Well, it's kind of just lead by example. Well, we've always done that, yeah. Don't preach, just lead by example. That speaks louder than anything else. Yeah. Don't let the plants die out in front. <laughs> <laughs> I just killed two of them, so. Mm. Well, those pots back. How, how have you seen the Oregon wine industry grow in the time you've been here, and what, what does the industry look like now as you, as you look at it 20 years into your journey? I think it's, uh, I, I'm encouraged the way it's growing. I mean, I think some, I don't know what other people think about it, but I think it's a good thing. I mean, you know, it's going to help all the brands get more recognition. I mean, we see some of the larger wineries coming up from either Europe or California or whatever, and, you know, I think, it's, I think it's a good thing for the industry. I really do. It's going to make everybody put their best foot forward and do a better job. Um, I'm, not gonna go I'm, to... I'm still encouraged on the Oregon wine industry. I, I think to. it's a great, a great thing. I mean, the wines are, are world class. Mm -hmm. I mean, they truly are. Yeah, because people used to ask, aren't you feeling threatened by all the different wineries? And the word is no, because what it does is um, makes you step up the game. Yeah. You'll get too lazy. You're not going to go in the middle of Kansas because there's one winery, but you'll go if there's 200 wineries. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about it. I mean, who, who does? The, well, they make you make put sense. your best foot forward, and that's, and what, that's ultimately it. that's what we want. We want yeah. the best wines out there, you know. And so let people decide. And and uh, well, I think I think it's great. I, I I feel positive about the work on the wine. I mean, obviously we see it. We see from the Europeans, the French are coming over, buying property. So something's we're doing something right here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, works good. Well, it offers more people um, things to see. I know some local, uh, if you're from here, it does bring the price up of land and all that. Um, so that does make it harder for some. Um, True. But that's going to happen regardless. Regardless. I mean, we, we were the example in California. We left because of the price came up. So. Well, the part where we used to farm in the Bush Gump right now, you yeah. didn't, there's no inkling of it. It's all, whoever had it is all homes and stuff. So well, if you don't see progress, gone. you don't see success. I mean, you got to move. You just got to be able to adapt with it and do it at, at the right pace. Mm -hmm. You can't overgrow with infrastructure if you don't have the infrastructure. And I think that's a, a lot of problems with places that are growing and they get overwhelmed and they grow too much. And then the infrastructure can if the highways, the the water system, the wastewater system, I mean, just everything from that. And, I, you know, developers and all that, they have a tendency to want to move. I get it. But it's got to be, you know, mm -hmm. at an even pace. Mm -hmm. You can't lose that in, uh, in sight because it, the last thing you want is to have people come up here and say, God, man, I don't want to go up there. You can't even drive. It takes me 20 minutes to go 10 miles. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think Napa sees a little bit of that. You go downtown Napa and it's just like, Good going down that main track, it takes forever to get anywhere. What makes me nervous is a lot of bicyclists around here, and Oregon's roads aren't quite for them. And you hear, you know, crash bangs. So they just need to somehow get a bicycle path or widen road. I don't know. All of it costs money, but uh, somehow that the part makes me nervous. No, I think bicycles. overall it's, 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 it's going in a pretty good direction, I think, I feel. Mm -hmm. What do you see for the future of the industry? What do you, or what do you hope for the future of the industry? I guess it continues in a nice way. Because right now the wineries do all get along very well, pretty well with each other. I would hate that to go away. You know, you don't want to get too much of a dog-eat-dog -dog world in, you know, like it. Well, I mean, I, we're seeing a little bit that... I mean, we get more people say, oh, they love coming to Oregon because it's so, you can actually come in there and talk to the owner or the winemaker. You go to Napa and it's just, you know, they never meet the owners or the winemakers or any of that. They come in, in a lot of these places, and we have a few that they don't get a meet or whatever, but they, so I would hope that uh, that would continue on that realm a little bit, but when you start growing and the brands get big, I mean, I, it's kind of tough. So, but I still think we're going to still have a lot of the, the smaller boutique people that you'll be able to have that. And I think Napa has it too. You got to seek them out. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Like any industry, I mean, we're we're like any industry really. I don't feel that we have 
we do make good wine and people love wines, but I mean, it's, a, it's an industry like anything else. Can't oversaturate it, and you gotta grow, grow naturally with it, and you know. When you're saying too about wineries, about where they're at, and you know, ours is downtown Amity on the back street. It's like, how come and why? And it's not at the, the vineyard, because it is beautiful out there. And I guess that's a little bit of selfishness. <laughs> we sit on the deck, and it is beautiful out there. Well, but we, we didn't want, the kids are at an age, there's no, I said, oh, there's no way we're gonna have a winery at our house. When all the kids. It was our private, that was our private life. And I've seen one of the people pretty. traveling out there and whatever, but. So we have the difference then, so when people come here, they're, they know they're not at a winery, or some are surprised. A vineyard. Or a vineyard, excuse me, not at a vineyard. So we have to let people know, you know, when they want big events, like, you know, you have to say, now we're not on a vineyard. So you have to let them be aware of that. Mm -hmm. But, because uh, a lot of them like to, it's Well, yeah, this beautiful. time of year, you love to be out up on the oh, vineyard, having gorgeous. a glass of wine, overlooking a beautiful Uncle, but vineyard But we have a fireplace in the winter, and we're busy for now. <laughs> we do. Come here in the wintertime when it's cold and rainy out there. You can sit by the fire and drink wine all day long. <laughs> no. <laughs> But it just worked out and well for us here. No. It just really worked out well for us. Mm -hmm. We do have a vineyard up there. We could do something if we really wanted to, uh, the Delfina Vineyard. But no, nah, we're, we're we're pretty content right here where we're at. <laughs> yeah, you know, we're we're getting up there, and we want to start tack taking on more projects. At our stage in our life, it's like. <sighs> We love what we do. We do, but it, you know, we're not going to live forever. We're not going to open up a new taste room we, somewhere else on You know, our hobbies, <laughs> I think you asked on the onset that, you know, what do you guys like to do for fun? We love to travel. Mm -hmm. We've been to Portugal half a dozen times. We've been, we threw them in throughout all of Europe. We've been, to, and we just love it. We love oh, to travel. Excuse me for one second. We love to travel. We want to spend a little more time with our grandkids. You know, we have 14 grandkids. Five of them live on the eastern side of the state, so. We do love to travel. Mm -hmm. that you asked about hobbies earlier on, and so that's really something. Well, we're great travelers together. We, I'm the driver. We get in any country. I, I drive. I never go on tours. I never do that. We're our own tour guide. She's my navigator, and I drive. <laughs> <laughs> and when we fly into somewhere, we, we book our room when we fly in, and we book a room when we leave. We never make reservations anywhere on the road because we never How know where we're going to end up. We're on a schedule here. If we're in Burgundy, okay. France, and we happen to meet somebody, and they come in, it, it, no, we have to be here. And such and such a date. No, we nah, don't. You're on vacation. Yeah, we go, we'll go to dinner with you. We'll have fun. We'll, yeah. We, so that's kind of that's kind of what how we we like to roll. Just we meet like, a lot of people that way. We like to roll like that. We just that's just I the way. Hear, and we roll you? like that here. I mean, it's just uh, if it happens, it happens. You know, spontaneous stuff. That's the best time. Well, that's all the questions I have. We could talk all day. I know. So yeah. are you going to change your vacations? There's the thing. Don't, don't your think. vacation planning. I I might. I don't know. How about you girls? Yeah. That's a, that's, it's, I've never heard anybody talk about it. I had that philosophy before. I gotta have some time to <laughs> stew on that, you know. Anyway, yeah, go ahead. Thank you both so much for your right. time, for sharing your hospitality, sharing your stories with us. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you both. We'll let you off the hook. All right. All right. Thank yeah. you so well, much, thank guys. You guys.